My guest on the podcast today is a recording artist who has spent over the last 21 years making amazing music and most importantly, making it his way. Eric Roberson has worked with some of the biggest names in the music business as a writer and a producer. He's been nominated for two Grammy Awards and a BET Award. He's taught at the Berklee School of Music, performed at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and released some of the best music of any genre in the past 20 years. Um, I'm just scratching the surface, y'all, because there's so much I could say, but let's just dive right into it. Welcome to the podcast, indie music and R&B music legend. And yeah, I said it. I said legend. Eric Roberson. What's going on, brother? I'm good, man. Glad to be here. Appreciate you having me. Great introduction, too, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're very welcome. You earned it, man. And thank you for coming. Um, how is everything? How's how's life treating you? How how are things in Eric Roberson world? All is well. Wife's happy. Kids are, are good. One's got the little sniffle cough, so he's home from school today. But uh, yeah, man, the road has been good. You know, everything is no complaints, man. The pen is moving. Uh, the voice is healthy. You know what I mean? So. Most okay. things, man, my parents are good, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I'm good, man. No complaints. How about yourself? I'm well. No no, no complaints at all. And I'm really good today, man. I'm getting to talk to you. Uh, one of the people I really appreciate your artistry over the years. And so I'm just uh, grateful and, and blessed to be talking to you. So let's just dive in, man. I'm, you know, I believe, first of all, that uh, congrats are in order. I know you just knocked a big item off your bucket list by playing a sold <laughs> out show at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Tell me a little bit about that, man. Why was it so important to you to perform there? And how did that all come together? How did it feel? Well, one, you know, I went to Howard University and knew of the Kennedy Center. When I was at Howard, I had the fortunate opportunity of performing at the Kennedy Center um, every Christmas with the uh, those event. Um, a musical called Black Nativity, and I performed mm -hmm. in that. So, I, you know, I was, you know, here's the dreams, man. One day, man, I would love to headline a show here, be here. And um, and it was always just there. You know, it was interesting. Um, I was talking with, you know, I got a great staff of people that work with me for the last, you know, for the last 10, 15 years. And I was talking with the, the booking side, and I was saying, well, you know, we can book our usual shows for all through, you know, 2023 and so in 2022, but, you know, we've really marketed lessons and really pushed really hard. Let's just take a step back and just see what we can get and, and remove what the norm was just to see what the possibility was. Did, do we have growth? Did we grow? Did we not grow? And then, you know, we started talking to Kennedy center and they said, well, would you like to do the 2300 seat room? <laughs> and it's like, man, I've never, uh, had a room that big before, but let's see if we could do it, you know? And I'll be honest with you that the staff had some concerns in the beginning and I was more about, I, I just want to know, you know, mm -hmm. guess what? If we sold 700 tickets, I still would have got out there and still would have gave my all in that show. The fact that we did sell it out um, just shows how supportive people have been towards me for the years. It was a great celebration. I'm still processing it all. You know what I mean? I'm still processing yeah. it, but I'm one who, man, in all honesty, I don't, and I mean this, I don't hold on to compliments or critiques too heavy. I don't really worry too much about the future and don't dwell too much on the past. I'm very much a, a very much now process kind of person. That's as a songwriter, it's what helps me write. So, yeah. I wasn't going to spend much time on the Kennedy Center. I was going to put it like, we're going to put this new show, this new lineup, this whole whatever. Uh, but it was more of a celebration for my team. It was more of a celebration for my family. You know, I had aunts and uncles that had never been to my shows before that were in the audience, you know, who were like, oh, okay, Eric doing well with this rock and roll, you know what I mean? And stuff like that, you know. But the next, you know, I was telling everybody, the, Two days later, I was in Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. and that show's got to be special too. You know what I mean? So um, it was great. It was a great accomplishment. I look forward to be on the stage again. I look forward to what other cities we can really expand like that. Um, but it, but it's process of a product. You know what I mean? So I'm right now. I'm focused on this interview, and I got a flight tonight, and I'm, you know I got a show in in California tomorrow. So it's like. You know, just how much can I be connected? You know, when I get off this interview, I got a little six-year-old jumping around and, and we're going to go right back to what we were doing exactly. <laughs> for this interview. So it's just yeah. locking in that way. But it's a great accomplishment and uh, we're going to keep building from there. That's, that's, that's good stuff, man. And it's real talk. That that 
that focus on being present in the moment, man, I think yeah. that's probably the secret to, in many ways, your success, tenacity, I'm sure is in there and talent yeah. and all those things. But being present is, is really, really powerful. And I also appreciate, and I think one of the reasons why you've had so much longevity is what you shared about that Cleveland show needing to be special too. Yeah. Um, although it may be the 50th show on the tour for you, it's the one and only show that many of those fans are going to see. So it's always going to be special to them. And so right. I'm sure people appreciate you understanding and appreciating that and creating those special moments for us. Indeed. Uh, you know, Eric, like the purpose of the podcast, right, is to explore the the power of embracing and, and loving one's authentic self as a as a pathway to joy in your physical and your spiritual life, but also uh, to find your calling in life, to build success, you know, in your career and stuff. And you just kind of scratch the surface of it there. That answer to that first question, man, I'm curious, who would you say is Eric Roberson at his core? Who are you? Not necessarily what you do, but who is Eric Roberson at his core and what, and what causes you to show up in the world the way you do, man? Uh, at the core, I'm a creator. Mm -hmm. And um, and I've been fortunate to be able to create moments, create opportunities, and uh, and create goosebumps. You know, I yeah. think that's the main thing, whether it's sitting down and talking with my friends and my wife or writing a song in the studio. And I told um, DJ Jazzy Jeff one time, we were working this project and he's like, man, but how we do that and this and that? And what about this? We had like all these producers and other artists. And I said, man, just throw everything out the window, man. The only rule is like, does it give you goosebumps? That's all, man. We just chasing yeah. goosebumps every day, all night. And I want something to bring me to tears. I want something to make me fall over there laughing. I want something to make me forget what I'm doing and daydream for the next five minutes while I process it. Right. So mm -hmm. at the core, man, I'm a person that's in love with the combination of words. I love this conversation. I love to write. Uh, I love to read and, and not just read books, but I love to like read people and read situations and like pull from it and learn from it. And, and, to apply that as a father and, you know, fly that as a, as an artist, you know what I mean? So yeah. constantly reading and writing, you know? Yeah. That's what's up. You mentioned Howard university. I know you're a DC dude to the core. Tell me a little bit about what it was like for you growing up in DC and how that upbringing kind of fostered this independent spirit that kind of sits well, inside. Well, I grew up in New Jersey. I'm in, I'm in New Jersey, but I went to Howard. I lived in DC for quite some time. So I, I at no point, I just don't need my, my go-go homies to, to beat me up by, you know, they may start thinking <laughs> I'm a commander's fan or something outside of that. I rep DC to the fullest, you know? Um, but yeah, man, Washington D.C. Ah, oh, just love the love the city. Love to go back there. Howard University was the place where I became a man. Where I like, mm -hmm. you know, the training wheels came off, and and I learned how to carry myself and apply myself, and got my heart broken and ran into a few brick walls, but I got better from it. And um, I think the hustling and the networking and uh, the transparency in my in my gift comes from those days at Howard and. I was surrounded by some of the most incredible teachers, but yet students as well and singers and actors and just artists in general and just thinkers. And um, yeah, man, it, it really shaped me uh, in really chasing. I would say that, you know, I've had the fortunate opportunity of watching people's dreams come true, including my, my own. Yeah. But it really starts like starts there. Like mm -hmm. when I tell you that, people I went to Howard with who owned businesses, owned tea shops in Brooklyn or restaurants, uh, who are movie stars or TV stars now, or um, governors <laughs> or mayors of major cities. You know, it's like, it is, it is amazing to me. I'm just like, we were all at one point just sitting in a yard talking about our dreams, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it worked. Not only like, and, and even if it's just more like you see somebody at home coming in, they're like, "Yeah, man, I got two girls, twelve and fourteen. And I'm just a, you know, a, a, man. That dream came true, man. It's like, man, I love it, man. I'm sitting on the porch with a shotgun now. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a right, fan man. of that. I'm a fan of like, man. I, rem I it was just yesterday we were walking through those dorm rooms putting you know, money together to get a Domino's cheese pizza, you know? <laughs> and and here we are now navigating and sharing our notes for our kids and, and our businesses and, and 
and root each other on, man. You know, and it, and it really, I will say that, I mean, of course, I have a great amount of friends from high school and even elementary school, but I think sharing the dreams really started at, at, at Howard for me. Yeah. HBCUs are really kind of amazing in all, mm-hmm. in all the ways. I was foolish enough not to do it, but my brothers both did it. <laughs> one went to Morehouse, one went to HU. Uh, and you know, hearing their stories and there's just a, there's a spirit that, you know, wells up inside them when they talk about it, that it's magical. Yeah. And I think almost every black kid who goes to college has ex- at least spent some of their time at HBCU. It, it's, it's amazing. And Howard's definitely one of those special ones for sure. And I'll say, I'll say this, man, I walked down hallways that Donnie Hathaway walked down, yeah. you know, I had the same English teacher as Donnie Hathaway and Roberta Flack. When she said that, I was like, forget English. <laughs> how was Donnie no, Hathaway like, you know what I mean it's like yeah. I mean and I, I I shared this story not too long ago you know Marlon Wayans was there when I first got there and a good friend of mine named Eric uh, we all called him Filthy it was a good friend of mine we still call him Filthy to this day he was best friends with Marlon and so I got really cool with him he was a great guy and this guy shot uh, Mo Money the movie with his brother over the summer and came back this guy has a movie out all over the world and he's mm-hmm. sitting in class and I cannot tell you how much that shaped me, man. Now, mind you, he wasn't there much longer, <laughs> maybe <laughs> a semester or two, but he was walking around that mm-hmm. campus, not like, Oh, I'm superstar. Now I've got more money. He was cracking jokes and sitting down and studying and doing homework. And I, was, yeah. I, I can't, I can, I, I, it shaped me, man. It really did. That was one of the things I don't, I don't know if I gave him enough credit, for that was my freshman year watching that and seeing the movie like looking at him and going so you can have that and still be like that wow okay you can have that and still be like that got it you know what i mean and yeah it was probably one of my first examples when i got there that really shaped how i handled myself whether success or not i got a record deal my sophomore year i was a year and a half later i was walking across that campus with a song all over the radio and Mm -hmm. i was learning back to that moment of like, how was he handling this? How was he handling this? How was he handling the, the attention and the pressure and, and, you know, the dreams and all that stuff like that. And, and humbleness to like get back and like do your take notes in class, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so I don't give enough credit. I gotta, I gotta make sure I say that more. Cause it was, it was, it was very shaping for me. That's a great story. I mean, it's good to hear that too about people, especially, you know, brothers and sisters doing their thing because so many of us are the first ones to do it in our families and, and yeah. that can take you to places that you don't necessarily imagine sometimes. But it's great to hear that people can have that kind of success and still be focused on what matters and still be yeah. humble. You know, I have a similar story with Michael Jackson stand in uh, when I was like 17 years old, working on the thriller video. Wow. And to this date, one of the kind, and I spent nine days, nine full days working with him, hanging out, playing video games, all the things one of the kindest, most normal, most regular people I've ever met or worked with in my life. And that was at the height, the height of fame. So it's it's a choice. It really is a choice. What's in you, of course, if you have weaknesses, they're gonna be uh, exacerbated by fame and and power. But at the end of the day, humanity is what matters. And if you can find a way to maintain that, uh, it's a blessing to everybody around you. And you, speaking of success, and you've had over 21 years of success as mm. an independent artist in an industry that's essentially ruled by majors and, and corporations. That's an achievement, first of all. So congratulations <laughs> to you, because I know music well. I used to work in the music business. I've produced and written as well. And I know how tough it can be, man. How did your time at HU really contribute to the kind of man that you became as an artist and, and, and the artist that you've become? Like, what impact did that have on you well well the one thing was you know i got a record deal while i was at howard but i also got dropped <laughs> from a record deal and mm-hmm. you know i took a year and a half off once things really started picking up and then when things got quiet and and the first record deal didn't work out then the second record deal didn't work out i went back to school and the same whispers were still happening it was just a different whisper you know it was mm-hmm. like a, what is he doing back or why is his music not playing? Is he still signed? You know, it's like you're hearing those whispers. So it was very humbling. And what I will tell you is I had the opportunity of, of visual, visualizing Howard from two different perceptions, right? Like I was a sponge in the beginning of learning stuff. Now I come back and I'm losing the money. I'm coming back and I'm losing the attention. I'm coming back, but it was like actually the greatest gift 
it was humbling. It was hard. But I was like, All right, I know what I want to do now. Now I know what I want to, what I need to strength, get stronger at, what I really need to focus on. And I came back a better student, a better person. You know, I became a better songwriter. Um, the artist I am today wouldn't be here without those lessons that when I went back, um, my grades were substantially better, you know, when I went back. Of focus and it was just amazing, man. I was, you know, so the lessons that I really gained from and even like just, uh, I remember not having really much money and like just going to the veggie truck and buying like a bowl of chili and like letting that bowl of chili last the whole day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, like just the yeah. discipline and, and whatever, like when I graduated, first of all, it showed me that, man, you could go back and you can get this paper. Like you can go back and graduate, but then I could get anything I want to do. I can accomplish it. And so when I went back into the industry, I was like, nobody's going to outwork me. Nobody's going to out hustle me. Nobody's going to outright me, you know? So, um, and it came from that. It came from like allowing me the chance to regroup. And I'll be honest with you at that time. I don't know if I knew what I wanted yet. That came much later. Um, I just knew whatever, whatever it was going to be, no one's going to stop me from getting it. So it's safe to say, man, that you didn't necessarily know what you wanted, but you were starting to get a strong sense of who you were. Yeah, completely. The, the, the desire to find out what was there for me started there. You know, it's like, there's something out there for me. I don't know what it is, but I want to be prepared for it when it shows up. I want to be able to recognize it when it shows up. And, and, and that, that started, you know, and I also say, man, you know, this is a little, this is a little small nugget, but it was, it was monumental. There was a group called Fertile Ground that was a DC based group. Everybody knows a legendary group and they were releasing music independently. They weren't signed by a major group and they were doing some great shows there. And it was my first sign of going, that group's not signed, but they're putting out albums. Hmm. I just pocketed it. Just put it in the pocket. And like, you know, years and years later, you know, I was like, I could probably do that for ground did it. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. You know, it was like, it was this little, it wasn't a monumental moment when I first saw it, but it was something I acknowledged. I was like, hmm, interesting. Put it in my pocket. And it was probably one of the biggest shifts for me, obviously, you know, um, it came in my career, but it was another people that I need to talk more about and give more credit to. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. I know I think it's also important, Eric, um, for people at some point to get a sense of what really matters to them in terms of what, where is your passion? Are you really a musician? Are you really an artist? And if so, yeah. you're going to be just as happy performing. If you're an actor, right? If you really want to act, mm. you're going to be just as happy in a 99 seat theater as you will in a 300 seat theater or in a film. Yeah. If you want to be famous, then that's a different path for you. So it's really about where does your passion lie? Where do you, where, where does your grounding lie? And man, when you look at your career, it's hard to say as an independent artist that you missed out on much. I mean, you've written and produced with some of the biggest artists in the world. You've toured, you sold records, and I'm sure you have a much larger percentage of the profits than you would have if you were on the label. I mean, is there anything that you feel like, uh, I might have done this differently, or yeah, it would have been nice to have a major label to do this, or are you just really kind of happy with where you've landed? Nah, man, if anything done? changed, the ups and downs, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. I wouldn't have that six-year-old over there on that iPad. <laughs> you know, if anything <laughs> changed, uh, so one, I, I have no regrets, and I wouldn't have changed anything because it got me where, I, where I'm at and what I've learned. Um, what I will tell you is that... uh you hit you hit the nail right on the head with what you were saying because a lot of times when I talk with the students that I work with, um, I say, you know, that you have to take the time to figure out what success looks like for you mm -hmm. and not what success is to your peers or to your parents, but what is it really to you? And what happens is a lot of times we get lost in this word survival and we want to survive doing this art and... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's going to be compromise to all degrees, but I will tell you, I mean, when I graduated, I, I got into business and I did very well for myself as a songwriter and a producer. And I got in some big rooms and I got a chance to really sit under some amazing artists and watch a lot of stuff. And what I will tell you is that more times 
more times than I would like to mention, I met people who weren't happy, yeah. who had everything that I really wished I could have, like in every which way, success and hits and money. And I found them not content. I felt them either blinded by the word survival, but not necessarily recognizing their purpose or their passion, whether they were on it or not. And I, it's funny, I had this conversation just the other day, yesterday, about a lot of people in the business, that it's possible that you could be in the music business and not love music. Like you can make music and not love music. And it sounds crazy. I, I can't be that person, but I can't fault someone who is like, okay, I've had a 20 year career. I've had all this success, but I, you know, it's just something to do more yeah. power to you. That can't be me. You know, for me, uh, I'm fortunate that I get the chance to write what I hear in my head, chase the ideas in my head, get on stage and sing songs that I love for the rest of my life, you know, and there's people who got to get on stage and sing songs that they don't like for the rest of their lives. And I hope they could find happiness and peace in that. Guess what? They'd probably rather do that than sit in the cubicle or something like that, you know what I mean? Or whatever. So mm -hmm. you got to find what success means for you. You have to find what that line is that you're willing to walk and what you're willing to compromise for. For me, you know, success is creativity. That's it. Like if I can get the idea out of my head um, and make it tangible and make me feel some way, then however it makes people feel in the world, I'm, I'm more than fine, whether it works or not, you know? And I've been, a, I've been fortunate to profit and make a living and flourish off of things that work and not be weighed down by the things that haven't. And it's been put, just as many things that haven't worked, as many songs that came out and, and it was crickets, right? Mm -hmm. And you go like, okay, all right, let's go right back and try another song and try another album and try another tour. And I've been fortunate. I've been doing it for a long time and a lot of things worked and we've been able to succeed and be and that, people to talk about that. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but we can't get caught up with the fact that like, as if everything works, it's not true. It's like, you know, the goal is to complete it all and, and let the cards fall where they may. And if you put your heart in all of it, some of it is going to be completed and not work. Some of it will complete and work. And when it works, you'll be singing that song for the rest of your life. You'll be, you'll be touring, for the rest of your life, you'll be able to sell a million t-shirts and <laughs> not just streams and stuff like that. So complete it, just complete it. Just follow your dream and, and see what happens, you know, and learn from it. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, man. I mean, failure is the best teacher oh. and you got to complete things because if you don't complete it, you don't know what the possibility is. And at the end of the day, what you're really talking about the core, when you talked about losing the deals and going back to school and you talk about some things work and you focus on the things that work and not on the things that don't, it's all coming down to choice. Yeah. Creation, creation is really a function of our choice. You, you're declaring to the world who you are with the choices yeah. that you make. Yeah, it's um, powerful choices. I never thought of it that way. Like, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, and also the choice to continue, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I often, I, when I, I'm at a point now in my life, in my business, especially, cause I don't like to, I don't like to fail for my wife. Right. Say, man, I want to win all the time with that. Right. <laughs> That's not good <laughs> when, for a bunch of reasons. <laughs> but when something in my business doesn't work, I get excited. I sit up, I go like, oh, oh we're about to learn something. Okay, cool. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't so look forward it. to the you failure. Process but I, it that way, bro. Say again? That's a choice. You're choosing the process. Exactly, that and that's a choice, right? So, so once again, like if you can, uh, if you can, if you can remove the pity, right, when something doesn't work, uh, when, if you can remove the oh, what was me, and and maybe allow yourself a little bit of time for that, but allow yeah. yourself to take the choice to see what's the purpose in the failure. Why did it fail? Yeah, Why did it fail for me? And what can I learn out of it? I promise you nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, there'll be something that will make you better for it. You'll be better. The betterment is in there. But a lot of times we take the, oh, I tried something that didn't work. Oh, God, why, why am I so unlucky? It's just, I hate doing this. And, whatever. and you missed the real lesson that was like right there in front of you. You missed the lesson, man. And then, you know, quite often people turn to, it's, it, it has nothing to do with you. You don't find the lesson. You just look, they, they just want these people that are shaking their ass. They just want, just 
And yeah. find out what works for you and why didn't it work this particular time and build from now. But it, it has nothing to do with anybody else. I no, mean, it, no. It, it's all about you. Um, you know, you have this term that you uh, that you refer to your music you create as honest music. I'm so yeah. curious about that term. Man. Unpack that for me. What does honest music mean to you? What does that mean when you say that? It's probably changed so much, but it still goes back to the chorus. It's um, being true. When I pick the pin up, there's no compromise. There's no room of like, will this song be better than the next song or who will like it? It's how do I feel? How How connected can I be? from how I feel to what I write. And I'm one that on my saddest day, I run to the paper and I write about it. On my happiest day, I run to the paper and I write. And there are certain times where I might sit at a keyboard and the chords might not be that soulful. You know, it might have a rock undertone to it, or it might, you know, I might sit at a drum machine and, and it might not sound too Dilla-ish or, it might go house music and we're, okay, we're doing house music tonight. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I grew up in Jersey, man. So we were in church on Sunday. We had choir rehearsal three times a week. <laughs> uh, we, in the classrooms, we were beat on the, in, the, in the cafeteria. We were beating on the tables, rapping with our friends, mm-hmm. we were studying hip hop and how people were dressing. And my dad was coming home with a bag every Tuesday of records and tapes. And it could have been anything from Chicago to Kenny Loggins to Earth, Wind & Fire to Curtis Blow. So I'm studying all that stuff. When I go to the clubs on Friday night with my boys, it was house music at the time. Hip hop hadn't taken over yet. So we were dancing to house music Friday night and Saturday night. And, you know, and then I was back in church again on gospel. So it's like, man, I love this gospel. What's that rock and roll thing? That's dope. What is that hip hop thing? Man, this house music is crazy. Make me dance. Oh, man, I love this soul. Man, I'm studying Stevie Wonder and Al Green. So when it's time to create, what do you do? Mm-hmm. What do you, like, am I supposed to close off what I love about country music? Am I supposed to close off what strings do to me? Am I supposed to close off what Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul f- make, how they make me feel? What about how I dance to house music? Am I supposed to turn that off? Honestly, man, I want to do it all. Yeah. So wherever I'm at, honestly, at that moment, that's what I do. And, and I've been very fortunate that, um, that my my fan base has tolerated <laughs> the <laughs> the levels of difference that things may happen, and it's not always super extreme night and day. But I don't think anyone is is any caught off guard when there's a rock song on my album, or caught off guard when there's a house song on my album, or caught off guard when there's a country song on my album. It's like for me, I'm a fan of soul music, and I look for soul in all art forms. So to me, like Radiohead is a super soulful rock band, and uh, I look for soul music in in country. I look and soul music doesn't mean it is this certain minor chord. For me, it's like, man, are you giving all of it? Like, are you are you is, are you bearing your soul in this song? So it could be a country song by the by the corkiest white guy in the world, and I'll I'll connect to it. Cause I'm like, that is that to me is soul music. You know, that to me, I understand what he's doing. So for me, honest music is like when I hit record, am I connected? Am I there? Yeah, man. Yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a thin line. Because when you think of it, first off, it, the origin of it is from blues. So, so if the origin of R&B is from blues, the origin of, uh, in, in folk and blues, it's like, we're pulling from the same place. And, and, and at the same time, and just the one thing about country music is like when they feel low, they write about it. Some of the most incredible lines you'll ever hear in your life will be in R and B and will be in country music, you know. You know, so yeah, I'm I'm listening to listen to it all. Brother, you know, a lot of young creators listen to the uh the, the podcast. And so this conversation, I've been so excited about it because I love you as an artist and a writer, but also I'm excited because I knew people were gonna learn a lot from hearing mm-hmm. this conversation and hearing you speak about it. One of the things that you've done, I usually ask people for advice that they would give to young creatives and people coming into the business. But for you, I have a different question. I want you to open up and share a little bit about this concept that you created called the process. 
yeah. where you let people into the process. Uh, tell, tell people who are listening a little bit more about that, because I think that's brilliant. And I think it's important for a reason I'll share after you answer. But I want to hear well, your thoughts it's, about it. It's, it's grown now. It's a subscription. It's now on Patreon, and it's around 800 people that subscribe to follow me in the studio, meaning every idea I make, they get a copy of it from the roughest idea. So if it's just a little small thing at three o'clock in the morning, me on a piano or whatever, they get it or a full production if I'm working on a project. So I've done my last five albums in front of them, like in all transparency. The beautiful thing for me is that I get a chance to learn what works right away. You mm -hmm. know, that if, if I write a song and they're going, Oh my God. And then like a week later, they're still like, Woo, this is crazy. Then you know that, Hey, you got something. And then sometimes right. when I post something, they're like, that was cool. All right. So what are we eating? You know what I mean? It's like, you realize, <laughs> okay, that, that song needs work, you know? And it's like, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll put, we'll put the time in. Um, and I have no problem with that, man. Like at the end of the day, like I said, creativity is my success. And, but I get a chance to test out, but it's also really showing people, um, like the art of completion and going from one area and really chasing an idea and trying not to overproduce or underproduce or overwrite or underwrite a song and, and just trying to find that sweet spot. They, they really are watching me like chase the idea, like, and try to find, Oh, that's it. Okay. And then find the purpose. I might write a song and then, you know, that song may sit for three years and then I go, this project, that's what this song is great with it, you know? So um, it's been great, man. And I think what it does mostly, or at least what I wanted to do mostly is to encourage everybody else to try their process and in, in what they're working on, whether it's writing a book or starting a sock business or, you know, a cookie company or something of that nature. It's like, what is it that can get you to your place? of completion um so i'm willing to show mine i'm willing to show the relationships that i have with other producers other writers how we're all coming together and networking and getting stuff they're just watching it all and seeing it all come together and i you know i make an album about every every two years for the most part i'm constantly writing all the time never stop so it, we just kind of turn into this album area so they see it heating up again you know and it's it's been a really fun process to do yeah, I mean, it's great, man. It's very giving of you, too. I mean, it's vulnerable because you're, you know, letting people in. You're seeing people seeing you sometimes, I'm sure, not at your best, uh, yeah, whatever yeah. that may be. But it's it's vulnerable, but it's also really, really generous of you because it helps people see what your process looks like. It gives them uh, some ground to kind of experiment and play with their own process. I, I just think it's brilliant, man, and I yeah, really thank appreciate you. it. Um, you know, the other thing too, Matt, like the world's so nuts right now, right? I mean, there's so much woundedness in the world. Everybody's walking around here between racism, sexism, our toxic politics. There's a lot going on. It's just, you know, it's a heavy moment. And I'm just curious, man, you know, you and I seem like we've grown up on some, a lot of the same artists, the same kind mm -hmm. of music. I'm so curious what you think the role is today, uh, if any, for black music and music in general and artists and you don't have to play in helping us heal kind of what's going on in the world or at least calling attention to what's going on. Because it seems like people are kind of disengaged uh, and, and, and the mm -hmm. art around us doesn't seem to deal with it. You know, I grew up on Gamble and Half. I grew up on, mm -hmm. you know, Aretha and Al Green and all these people when I was a kid, you know, listening to them. They have, they're talking about love. They're talking about relationships, but they're also talking about what's going on in the world around them and inspiring yeah. people to be more, do more, at least be aware of. Do you see a role for musicians or, you know, some musicians, some songwriters in that, or you think that's just something people need to work out on their own? No, it's, it's always a role. It's always a priority. Um, I do believe there's a, a risk of disconnect now, but what I will tell you is that it's always been an act of service. When you look back as far as back as we know history, not even just in black music or black people, but songs have been the soundtrack of whatever movement, there's always been a trumpet player playing behind that army that's marching towards the bullets and the cannons. And, you know, but at the same time, it was a soundtrack to the, to the entire slave movement. Uh, uh, the civil rights movement was, was, was motivated through song, whether it was the staple singers, you know, obviously mm -hmm. when you look at uh, Vietnam or um, look what Marvin Gaye did with just what's going on. Right. And he, his brother comes back from war and he's just kind of seeing his brother and building from it, what he's witnessing. And he's able to make this song. Like that's the album is, is so relevant still to this day. It's ridiculous. Right. Like it, it doesn't make any sense. I was something 
there's not one line where you go like, well, that that's more for that time, not for now. No, it's everything is like right for right now. So, and then when you get to hip hop, which to me, hip hop is like a Polaroid snapshot of your neighborhood. So mm -hmm. if your neighborhood is um, crime ridden, it's probably going to be about that. If it's, you know, if y'all plugging up turntables and and stealing electricity from the from, from the light pole <laughs> and and partying, it's probably going to be that. And and so West Coast hip hop was, was going to sound like West Coast hip hop, and South was going to sound like South, and everything was supposed to be a snapshot. And guess what? When someone would be unfortunately shot by a police officer, or when there was a riot, you would you would take a snapshot of that too. Um, and I think. I don't want to say that we went through a pandemic of the last two years and no one wrote about it because I, I can't say that I've been in my own bubble to some degree. Um, but we had, there's a risk of disconnect. Uh, I feel like during the pandemic, there were more people providing for service than ever in art. You got comedians who were just getting online and just, telling jokes, you had D-Nice getting on spinning for 10 hours straight just to get people to take their minds off. Um, we had people that were putting out projects, including myself, where we weren't concerned about marketing or like selling records. We were just like, man, anybody who needs it, man, just take it. Because I'm going to the studio every night just to get my mind off of the fact that the tour schedule is canceled, my kids are home, uh, it was called Friends Are Sick. I'm just writing and recording just to make myself feel better. And guess what, if it makes you feel better, here, 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 just take it off, you know? Um, but I don't know if necessarily there's like, there was, I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement was so powerful, but I don't know, including myself, I don't know if, I don't know if we wrote enough about it. And what I'll tell you is that like, for me, the hardest thing to do is for me to like, I'm going to go in the studio today and write a song about my child, right? Because my child is too important. So at times it invades the honesty because I'm forcing it more than writing it or finding it, right? And I think maybe that's interesting. Yeah. That could be a little bit of that, but there's a there's a responsibility that we have to document what is going on and put it to verse, put it to art because that's what art does. Art is either going to help you escape or help you wake up. It's either going to take you to a place or bring you to this place, right? It'll remind you of something or help you forget. And I've done my part. I mean, I've, I've written songs, uh, you know, of all levels of injustice. And sometimes it's to help you feel stronger and help you forget of a time or I cannot let you forget this moment. You may only listen to the song one time but you're going to listen to it this time and you're going to cry and you're going to realize how horrible this particular situation is. And then we're going to move on, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but music is competing with a different kind of thing now. Uh, I tell people that I'm not necessarily competing with Usher and PJ Morton. I'm competing with Candy Crush and Instagram and TikTok. So yeah. when something happens, people source on how they respond to it may not always lean to music, you know, mm -hmm. like it did before. There's other options now for people to go to when there's an injustice in your city or um, people are losing jobs or, you know, um, the election, you know, doesn't go the way we, we want it to go. There's so many avenues, it's, you know, and I think it's important, but the artist shouldn't be discouraged because that's why I said a risk of disconnect because I think there's yeah. people making great music. It's just maybe not always as obvious to connect as it was 20 years ago or 50 years ago. Yeah. You bring us some good points, man. I think it's, it's tough too, because, you know, we live in this society and at the center of the society is, you know, racism, of course, but there's also capitalism. And I think so yeah. many people become such capitalists that the idea of doing anything to interrupt the possibility of the flow of the paper paralyzes fear, people and fear. And they're like, you know what? I'd rather just write this turn up song and keep it safe because that way I ain't gonna piss nobody off. The other thing though that troubles me about it sometimes though, man, keeping it really real is, you know, the artists that I tend to be into personally, whether, you know, they're current artists or old artists or people that were really 
honest, right? Really true mm-hmm. and, and, and committing and what they feel and what they experience uh, to, to wax or to tape or whatever. And the question I find myself asking sometimes is not so much like, don't you feel responsible? Shouldn't you do this? It's not that so much as it's like, you really don't feel anything about what's going on right now? <laughs> like you really? Like seriously? You don't yeah. feel anything about what's going on? And if you're talented, creative, and you're passionate and you care about yourself or your people, I feel like you'll find a way. Like Beyonce is a perfect example to me. Who has more to lose than her? Who's bigger than her? But she still makes us know Mm -hmm. that she's connected to what's going on around her, that she feels a little something. And I think that's really all, you know, people like me is asking for. I'm like, you is this thing on? Are you feeling anything? Like, are you watching this? Um, And so I, I don't know. Yeah, and I think especially a lot of your, even your young hip hop songs and so like that, it's like they're not even acknowledging. It's just more about you know, I'm gonna get this paper, I'm gonna get it lit tonight. You know, like yeah, but well, what about? Uh, but then you see that they're fathers and mothers, you know what I mean, and and that they're investing as well. But it's like I don't know, man. It's I, I, yeah, it's often it's often a question for me as well, man, and I. I don't know if everybody always in, invest in the betterment, like the betterment of things. And like you said, sometimes it's about just like, man, do you feel, do you, like, you see what's going on? Do you feel that? You know? And that is the challenge as, as writers, because the goal is when you feel something, can you translate it into verse and into a melody that can help amplify that feeling and that message and extend exactly. it, you know? First, you got to yeah. feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you gotta feel it first. Yeah, yeah, I know. Feeling anything, but you know, they go back to that that thing of being confused by that word survival. And a lot Mm -hmm. of times, what I'll tell you is, a lot of times writers will first go, and I see this all the time. They'll go, "Well, no, nobody wants to hear that." I would write that, but no one wants to hear. What do you mean, no one wants to hear that? Um, you have like a, I don't want to say an artist's name or anything, but like you'll have an artist who. Maybe their their main demographic is women and their their main tone may be sexual. So they'll say, like, that's off my base. Nobody wants to hear me sing that. But but you live it though, right? So like you I don't mean you gotta sing it all the time, you know, but every once in yeah. a while you can you can kind of shed light on on that, you know what I mean? It's like I think it would go back to choice. But I think a lot of times when people pick up the pen, they're they're focused more on product than process. Like I said, once again, it's process over product, right? Absolutely. It's like, what will people think of this? Well, will, will it work? Will it be successful? Absolutely. Will it be better than the last thing? It's like, you know, what, what do you feel? What do you, what right now when you pick the pin up? And guess what? You also have the right that the world could be on fire and I can, it's possible that I may pick the pin up and I feel like being silly to take mm-hmm. my mind off the fact the world's on fire. Right. And it, it, it's like there's all options. But, but sometimes you got to write about the fire, too. Like You know, what I mean, like exactly. It's, but the thing, Eric, is I agree with you. But the thing is, if you feeling like you need silly as the out, outlet, that's going to be the dopest silly song ever. Exactly. Exactly. But if you're writing go with back, marketing yeah. in mind, it's going <laughs> to be some marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Ish. I mean, and that's that to me, it goes back to, like I said, the honest thing. It's like it's funny. My my. um my mom has been asking for me to make a Christmas album for like the last seven, eight years. Right. And one thing about Christmas albums, you got to start working on them in like February, if you're going to yeah. do it. Right. So she's always like November at Thanksgiving table. Why don't you do a Christmas album? I say, ah, ma, I kind of missed the time limit. Right? So <laughs> I, you know, but what will happen is, and I'll be honest with you, I could go and I, I mean, I could go in and say, I'm writing a Christmas song, I'm writing a Christmas song. Cause that's sometimes it's business. But a lot of times I just write in and go, what do you have for me, God? What, what am I supposed to write about today? What do I feel? And I just haven't heard a Christmas song because I don't walk in going, today I'm writing this. I, I Man, I stopped that like 12 years ago. Like, you know, the days when I was a songwriter producer, I was like, who's looking for a project? Mary G. Blige. Okay, let's write Mary G. Blige songs. What would Mary G. Blige want to hear? Now I just walk in and go, what do I feel? Okay, I'll write that. And if it's a Christmas song, great. But more times than not, it's just whatever I was doing that day. And going back to that moment again, like, I don't believe in writer's block. I don't believe in it. And I think it's just being over picky. So if, if I told a student, write about that park bench, the first thing you go, nobody wants to hear about a park bench. How do you know that? 
Like, exactly. you don't know that. Write it, right? And how clever can you write about the park bench, right? The park bench might, it might be a song about the park bench relationship with this old lady that comes and sits there every day, right? And it's like, that might be the story. So, so how clever can you write about the park bench to hold people's attention? Maybe that's the challenge, but how, how true can you be to how you feel and put it to paper and put it to like, turn the mic on and be real. And that's the challenge. But what shouldn't be there is like, will it work? Will people like it? That's a distraction. Yeah. That's a distraction. It's, it's a it'll distraction. get in the way of the words, it'll weigh the words down and, and it will remove the honesty and, 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 and truth that's in that song, that, that the possibility, because, and I'm, I mean this, I don't write anything. I find it. I don't think any of us do. Right. The words mm-hmm. have been here before the notes. I, I'm not, I never will sing a note that someone else hasn't sung before. Right. So I may be combining things better than other people can. I'm really good at combining feelings and stuff like that in mm-hmm. melodies. But at the end of the day, that, oh my God, didn't start here. <laughs> right. Exactly. I did that because I found it. Right. I did that because yeah. when I experienced love or experienced heartache, I went, I gotta write about it because yeah. I felt this Can treasure. Like, I, but I didn't create the treasure, and that's the problem. We we make the mistake that we think that we create it. We don't. You don't create any of this. You find it, and then you yeah. you make it tangible. Right? You know, it's a fisherman doesn't create the fish; he catches it. And then he cooks it better than other people can, or and he serves it better than other people can. But he didn't create it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. I think that's the thing where we we get lost at. Uh, man, get out of the way of yourself and find what's there for you today, this year, in your life. Like, you know what I mean? Nothing to lose but yourself, right? Exactly. So like, man, lose yourself and find and find yourself and find what's there for you. And really then I think the the real songs, the helpful songs um, really show their way. Because if I go back even to Marvin Gaye, what's going on? That album had nothing to do with him. He was a vessel. You know Absolutely. what I mean? In the day, if the album was bigger than he. Than, I'm not, and there's no disrespect to Marvin Gaye. Obviously, I'm one of my favorite singers. Mm-hmm. The, the album was more important than him. He was more just a vessel. He took something that inspired him. He found his brother home, struggling to adapt back to the real world from going to war. And he transcribed that into like some of the most amazing music you'll ever hear in your life. And what he did not do, is he didn't get in the way of it. He allowed it to 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 grow and develop, and it and it did, and it did, and it, and we still cherish it to this day. And that's what we need to do. Yeah, and in touching on Marvin Gaye, you bring up another point that I talk about all the time with my friends and and artist friends, is this this lack of continuity in terms of sharing our history right Mm -hmm. as african americans we are uber creative and that is our gift and that's a beautiful thing and i'm grateful for it but in some ways i think it's our curse because we're always on to the next thing and we rarely take time to appreciate that which is here or came before us i mean my, my white friends they'll they take their kids to a rolling stone concert and their 15 year old kid is as into it as they are yeah Half the black kids I know don't even know who Earth, Wind, and Fire is, what it is. Yes. Yeah. And that saddens me. Is there any kind of role you feel like we have as as elders? And ugh, the E word, but you know what I mean? Do we have a role in sharing this history? Because, you know, you got so many young artists, they literally have no idea what came before them. And by before them, I mean 10 years ago. Yeah. But well, I see that's the wrestling that. match, right? Because let's even go even further. Like uh, about 10 years ago i believe it was maybe a little bit longer than that uh i just woke up and was like oh my god i gotta talk to my aunts and uncles i gotta talk to my grandma i gotta, I gotta ask them these questions i gotta figure out so in the north we say roberson in the south we say robertson right mm-hmm. and my family uh half my family well my fa- the, the robertsons live in a town called stokes north carolina right next to it is a town called robertsonville north carolina and going and see my grandmother and my grandfather and all my family, I would always think, oh, see, that's interesting. My name's on that city. Thought nothing of it. Until one day I'm riding with my grandmother and she goes, oh, that's the Robertsonville Plantation. That's the Robertson Plantation right there. And I go, oh, that's where my family was slaves at. That's where our family, oh, 
oh, that's where Paul Robeson's family was at. Oh, oh, it, it's like boom, boom, boom. So it, it, just that one mm-hmm. little statement she said, hey, oh, that's the Robinson plantation. Open this can of worms. And like, if you're not careful, we all evolve and those lessons, those history and our secrets will be closed off. You know, mm-hmm. grandma, what was your mom's name? What was your dad's name? What was your aunts and uncles' names? How many kids did they have? Where did they live at? What, what, you know, just like pick as much as you can. And interesting enough, I'll be honest, I don't think our aunts and uncles, our great aunts and uncles, our great grandparents and grandparents, I don't think, I don't think they're, I don't, I don't feel like they have an urgency to, to share it. Right. It's almost like naturally we almost have to grab it from them. You know, yeah. grandma, what's that? What is your recipe for this mac and cheese? You have to show it to me. All right, come and just watch. Just watch. I'm going to show you. But they were like, come here. I want everybody to watch it because one day I won't be here to cook it. Like, you know what I mean? And yeah. I think it's the it's the same thing with music, right? You're right. And I just came here as well. I said, I don't really focus much on the, the, the in music or in my personal creativity. I don't focus much on the future or will it work. I don't really dwell too much on the past. I'm very much a now person. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I have three kids here who are taking an interest. And you have to show them Earth, Wind & Fire. Oh, my God. Look at this catalog of work. You have to show them Stevie Wonder and Roberta Flack and Shaka Khan. Um, and Moni Love and Queen Latif, and, you know, and Slick Rick and, you know, and Tribe Called Quest. You have to, they have to know this so they can pick and choose because, and I, and be honest with you, I mean, my dad would come home with a bag of music. I don't know if he was necessarily saying going, now son, sit here. I'm going to show you today. This is Al Green, right? You know, I think he came in and he put on Al Green and he said, ooh. And as a kid, I watched him and it's like, that's what I do for you. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. And one day, the analogy is one day, my dad's church ties made sense to me. One day his blazers made sense to me. So one day when I got a little bit bigger, I went in his closet and I put his shoes on. And I, if you look at any of my high school pictures, I went my dad's clothes all through high school, right? Mm-hmm. Cause one day it made sense to me, right? Yeah. So my dad wore it my whole life. And I'm like, you wearing that tie? I don't know where that tie. You wearing that? It didn't match the 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 sneakers that we was wearing or the the eight ball jackets that we was wearing. The one day I got a little bit older and was like, you know, that blazer actually is kind of fly. So I, I don't know if I want. I don't know if it's force feeding, but we have to ask ourselves: Are we? It, man, is Earth, Wind, and Fire playing in my house consistently? Is you know what I mean? Is yeah? Is it playing consistently enough so that one day they look up and go? I see how that makes you feel. I wonder if it'll make me feel that way, you know? Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I'm never one to ridicule any art form or any song that's ever come out. Uh, If it's creativity, it's creativity. So I'm at the same time, like, what you listening at? And I'm not going to be like, well, that ain't how we used to do it. Let me show you tonight. (laughs) No, let me hear what you're doing. And even in this most simplicity, you know, caveman form... (laughs) of production or whatever i'm like it gave a feeling if it's making you hop up and down it's working okay i yeah. how's it make you hop them down so i can hop up and down i want to learn from it too and that's how i learned to appreciate go-go music when i first went to howard or house music the first time watching my sister dance to it um and the stuff that my kids are coming home singing when they get off the bus you know so mm-hmm. it's a sharing thing it's a sharing thing, but I think it goes from that. I think that to see me proudly wear it and one day they'll wear it. They see me proudly talk about it. You know, uh, behind me is just pictures of that's my mom, right? If I show over here, there's a yeah. picture of my, my dad There's this faint picture of my aunt Christine. And every once in a while, it's just sitting here for when that six year old goes, dad, who's that? Oh, that's your aunt Christine, buddy. Let me tell you about it. Boom. Mm-hmm. Right. You got to wear it, man. You got to wear it so that when they do take interest, it sticks more. It sticks yeah. more. At least that's what worked for me, and that's what I'm trying to do with them. No, that's real. Man, I'm not going to take too much of your time, but I'm going to mention some names. We're going to lighten this up a little bit. I'm going to mention some names, and I want you to just say to me, rapid fire, the first adjectives of thoughts that come to mind. All right? You ready? Got you. Jill Scott. 
my my sister. I remember when she walked in the studio for the first time. I never doubted it was going to work for her. You knew mm-hmm. everyone fell in love with her immediately. Immediately, she just she just she had it. She had it like if ever I seen someone have it, she had it. Music soul child. The most unique sounding person I've ever heard. I remember when he walked in the studio for the first time too. That touch jazz in Philadelphia. His approach to music was and still is to this day the most unique approach I've ever seen. He sings the ABCs different than anyone else would sing it. He sings the Lord's Prayer different. You, you, I started working with him mainly out of, hey, listen to this. How would you sing that? <laughs> and I was just sitting <laughs> in awe with how he heard, heard it back and interpreted it. Um, yeah. To this day, most unique, unique approach I've ever seen. Raheem Devon. Uh, the fastest rider I know. Uh, really? When I first met Raheem, it was like he had a a pen in each hand and he was riding like this. But I'll tell you about most people don't know about Raheem. So I'll go back a little bit. You know, Prince would do a concert and then if anybody knows, Prince would then do a little small concert like somewhere, some little hole in the wall. Like, so he'll do like Back Madison Square Garden. And then three hours later, he'll be in like some little bar playing with it. The whole band, Prince and the Revolution. It was, it, it, and it was his whole career. Everyone knows that, right? It's like this. One thing most people don't know about Raheem is that Raheem does a concert, maybe Milwaukee or Memphis, Tennessee. And then after that concert, he's probably, he finds a little studio in Memphis, Tennessee, and he goes there and records. And he's been that way for as long as I've known him. He'll do a show in New York and then he'll go into some little studio and he'll write in New York. Then he'll do a show in Baltimore and he'll go find a little studio and he'll be in, and he'll go and, you know, he'll be in Seattle, Washington and he'll do a concert. And then after the concert, more than likely he's probably going to be in a little studio in Seattle, Washington. And that's where he's been. And he's the only one I know that's like that. He's the fastest, like by far the fastest writer I know. That's dope. I had no idea. So you learn something new every interview. <laughs> uh, Rasan Patterson. Ah! <sighs> Our mutual friend. A mutual friend. He may hold my attention more than any other artist on stage. That's quite a statement, bro. He may hold my attention more than any artist on stage. And I, uh, I don't have the security to take the pace that he does. I'm also in awe a lot of times when I hear songwriters, like even Sade, where she might go, I won't pretend, and then pause. I'm like, how did you leave all that space there? You know, me, I would be like, I won't pretend that I won't leave you and never want to leave you because my insecurity won't leave that space, right? Mm-hmm. And Rasan will, he might go, uh, When I, and I'm like, <laughs> how is he leaving all that space? But yeah, he owns it. He mm-hmm. holds my attention more than anybody. I, can, I can't think of another person that when he walks on stage, he reminds me of like, you know, Miles Davis, you watched what he played, but then you also watch how he walked when he wasn't playing. Yeah. When, when yeah. Herbie took a solo, Miles would step back and look at him and be like, and you might watch Herbie, but you actually was watching Miles because Miles is his his swag. And then he's like, all right, Tommy Black. And he picked the trumpet and he started walking back. And it's like, it was a whole, his show is all of it. And I think that's mm-hmm. Rasan. Rasan is like, somebody should check out, like his, his show is all that. He holds my attention more than any other artist on stage. That, that's profound. I agree with you though. Um, that's how I experience him too. And it's something about that emptiness. That, that It's not even emptiness, that, that pause, that break. There's brilliance that in comfort. That yeah. That comfort. Security. And He's somebody who's guess. comfortable in his own skin, too. Yeah. Yeah. Last one, most important one, most likely, your wife, Sean. Ah. <laughs> uh, I've never gotten tired of her to this day. I've never, even if we, you know, even if, even if we argue or something like that, right? There's like, all right, what you want to eat? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I I can sit around her all day, all night, and just never get bored, never lose interest in what she has to say. And I think 
that was the part when I noticed that, that I realized that she was the one for me. And the other part is that and I was a struggling writer and a struggling artist and a person really locked in trying to survive in this business. And what I will tell you is that in all honesty, from the moment I met her, uh, things have worked. It just worked. You know what I mean? Uh, and I'll give you a quick story. I'll tell you like, because I always say that there's, there's support and there's toleration, right? She tolerates yeah. a lot, right? <laughs> she tolerates <laughs> a lot. But uh, Fred Hammond called me, and anybody knows like he's the reason why I write songs. And he said, uh, hey, man, I'm, I'm starting a new group, and I want to know if you want to join it. I want to do an album with a group. And I had just had my second son, and I, I was struggling with traveler's guilt. I couldn't, I couldn't even go to the grocery store. My second son got in. I was like, touring? I can't tour. I was, I, what am I supposed to do? I, I don't want to leave my kids. I, ah, right? Yeah. I, was standing, I, was, I was standing outside getting my son out the car seat when he called. And I said, that was Fred Hammond. And he wants, he wants me to join a group. He wants to do a group. And he lives in Dallas, Texas. I live in New Jersey. I'm like, and she saw me struggling. And she said, if we got to move to Dallas, you're doing it. If we got this up and move to Dallas, you're doing a group. You got to do the group. And I was just like, who are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's Sean. That's Sean. Like she's straight from the straight from, she's his toughest critic. It, you know, there's times where I write a song and she'd be like, mm -mm. and there's times where she write, I write a song and she goes, Oh my God, that's incredible. You know, she's the first, she's the first bar. She's the first one. She's the first one I'm trying to please. And she's the one who holds my attention you know, just in life, in life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so uh, she completes me in that way. That's what's up, man. Thanks for sharing that. Man, I mean, before we let you go, man, your current release is called Lessons, and that I have listened to back yeah. and forth and forth again. I know that's available on all platforms. You've got this debut, debut book of yours, Lessons, 100 Thoughts on Love and Life. And you got the Lessons Tour going on, man. I just yeah. saw that recent Houston date, which I'm still mad I couldn't be at with Raheem and, and Rasan. But all that being said, man, how are things going and how can people support you? I want to leave people with a way to connect with you and support what you're doing right now, brother. Things are growing great. I'm still learning. I, you know, it's crazy. I've had vocal issues. I've had vocal cord surgery, you know, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, eight, nine years ago. But I will say this most importantly, man, I'm singing better than I've ever sang before. I'm healthier than I've ever been before, right? So that's the first part. So I'm able to share more than I've ever been able to share. Um, uh, to get in touch with me first, you know, the process is something I think is something everyone should take a look at. So you just go to jointheprocess.com, jointheprocess.com to do that. Or you can go to ericrobersonmusic.com to see the tour dates we have, um, to see the products that we're working on, the t-shirts that we're designing or the songs that we're creating, uh, albums we're putting out. Um, that's just a hub. You know, of course you can go to Instagram and all the other stuff like that, but that those two areas are the main two areas that if you want to support or just learn what we're doing, what we're working on, what we're investing in, those are the two places you can go to. That's what's up, man. Well, thank you for your time today. Thank you for showing up always and being yourself, being authentically you and sharing with us. Uh, we appreciate you, y'all. That's Eric Roberson. We're going to put all that stuff he just shared with you in the show notes so you'll be able to access it there. Brother, I thank you so much. Have a Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Likewise. All that. And send Sean our love. Tell her we appreciate her for making you even more of who you are. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell her as soon as I go upstairs, and she's gonna say, "What? Well, you're welcome." You're <laughs> <laughs> no, I All appreciate right. you, Eric Robertson, y'all.